Before we start to look at wave functions in quantum mechanics, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the classical wave equation. So we're going to talk about this because there are some important relationships that show up, some corollaries we're going to see between quantum mechanics and how classical waves behave. So we're just going to use this as kind of an intro to see some of the techniques which are going to be useful to us. So let's say we have some string here and then we're gonna have that string fixed between two ends and it's allowed to vibrate in between those two ends with some type of displacement so let's say we have this function u of position x and time t which is just the displacement of this wave Okay, and then we're going to have it fixed at x equals 0 and x equals a quantity L. <clears throat> okay, so we want to solve for what this displacement is over time, where it is across different positions and where it is in, at different places in time. So in order for this to be a wave, it's going to satisfy the classical wave equation, which is a second order partial differential equation. Now, differential equations aren't the focus of this series, so we're only going to discuss them sparingly, but it's important because the Schrodinger equation, which is the key equation in quantum mechanics, we'll see is a second-order differential equation also. So the techniques we discuss here are going to be useful to us later down on the road, later on down the road as well. So this equation, we have the second partial derivative with respect to position equals... 1 over velocity squared, second partial derivative with respect to time. So in order to solve a PDE like this, what you'll normally do is try to use a technique called separation of variables. We're going to try to separate this function into two parts. One function which depends only on x, depends only on position, and one which depends only on time, t. Okay, so if we take this and we substitute it back into our original expression here, what we'll see is that when we differentiate with respect to x, well, this t part has no x dependence, so we can pull it out there. So we can bring this t of t function out, and then this derivative will act on the x part, but now this x is this x is only a function of one variable. So when we're differentiating with respect to position, that's the only variable in that function. So now this isn't a partial derivative anymore. Now this is a this is just an ordinary derivative. So we have an ordinary second derivative. And that's going to be with respect to x. Then over on this side, applying the same logic, if we substitute in u of x t for these two separate functions here, we're going to see that this x part doesn't depend on t. So when we differentiate with respect to t, we can just pull the x out. And we get the x function over v squared times. And then once again, this t is being differentiated with respect to time and it only depends on time so this is no longer a partial derivative this is now an ordinary derivative so d squared t of t dt squared okay now we try to isolate the variables on each side so we try to get all the things that depend on x on one side all the things that depend on t on the other side so what we're going to do is divide both sides by x of x and t of t. So dividing both of those, we're going to cancel out the x on the left here, and we're going to get a t on the bottom. And we're going to cancel out this t over here, and we're going to get an x on the bottom. So rewriting this equation now, once we've divided by both sides, we're going to get something that looks like 1 over x of x d squared x dx squared equals 
1 over v squared t of t, second derivative of t, with respect to time. Okay, now it's important to note that we've got a function here which varies in space, and we've got a function here which varies in time. And they have to be equal to each other at all instances of space and time. So we can vary time independently, and that's not going to change the x value, so this side has to stay the same. And we can vary time, uh, and we can similarly do the vice versa. So while these are varying, the other side has to stay the same. So the only way this can actually be true is if both of these sides are equal to some constant. Let's say it's k. Now for reasons that we'll see in just a minute here, I'm also going to say that this constant, which is going to be some value which doesn't change, is also equal to this quantity I'm going to call beta squared. Okay, so each of these sides is equal to beta squared. So if I multiply, if I take this side and I multiply by the x of x function, I'm going to get something that looks like I'm going to get that the second derivative of x of a function with respect to x equals that same function times a negative constant squared. And similarly for t, I'm going to get back the second derivative of this function with respect to t equals minus b squared v squared t of t if you multiply both if you multiply both of these sides by v squared t you get this result here so we need a function that's going to when taking its second derivative gives back itself times a negative constant squared now normally at this point in differential equations what you'll do is start guessing solutions so one particular function that satisfies this, this rule is a sine function. So if I take the second derivative of a sine function, I'm going to get a negative sine function back. And if that sine function has some extra parameter inside the argument here, then um, from the chain rule, then it's going to go outside here. And taking the second derivative, it's going to come outside twice. So this beta here can be represented by having x of x equal some constant times works for cosine as well cosine beta x and it also works for sine so it can be this can be any sine or any cosine function and if you differentiate this yourself, take the second derivative, you'll find that you'll get minus beta squared times this original function. So this does indeed satisfy our requirements based off of our separation of variables assumption. Then if we do the same thing for t, we're going to get the same function except for now instead of beta, we're going to have beta times v inside of here. So we're going to have a different constant, say c cosine beta v t, this time depending on t, because this was uh, differentiated with respect to t, plus d sine beta v t. And this a, b, c, and d, they can be any constant. You can change those to any value you want, and these equations will still be true. And if you multiply the product of these, you'll see that it satisfies this equation here. Now to go beyond this, we're going to have to start applying the specific conditions to the system we're talking about, um, this, this string with fixed ends here. The, everything we've done thus far is completely general and doesn't have any restrictions over the range of which it is valid. It's only going to be when we apply more specific conditions to our specific problem that a more specific formula is going to fall out.